Hello, folks. This is Mark Steiner, and welcome here to The Mark Steiner Show on The Real News Network. Good to have you with us this week. This book came across. I didn't expect it, but I'm glad it's here. It's by Jeff Biggers, who wrote this book, The United States of Appalachia, which I loved. Never interviewed him for that book. But he's written a new book called Resistance, Reclaiming an American Tradition. And a dear friend of ours, Wayne Carlin, our mutual friend, who is a Vietnam veteran and I consider one of the dean of Vietnam veteran writers, sent me an email saying, this fellow Jeff Biggers is in town, you should meet him. So here he is in our studios to talk about his book, Resistance, Reclaiming an American Tradition. And that's the book. The stickers don't come with the book. Uh, those are my stickers. But um, if you make a contribution to uh, Real News, maybe I'll send them to you. You never know. But anyway, we're here with Jeff Biggers. And Jeff, Jeff welcome. Good to have you with us. Thanks uh, much for having me, Mark. Really appreciate it. Good, really good to meet you. Um, yes. I really did like the United States of Appalachia. I thought it was a really significant piece. You know, it was uh, really a labor of love. Think about it. It's already 13 years ago that I put that out. And I felt like we really needed to go back to our roots, our beginnings, and reframe one of the most maligned and misunderstood regions. And then lo and behold, here we are again in this era of so-called Trump era, where we're often looking at Appalachia as to, to define, you know, we've had this phenomenon of the hillbilly elegy book that right. everyone's reading, who, who actually goes back and he casts aspersions and says, you know, it's all your fault. I got out. How come you didn't get out? And, and he completely misunderstands the history and the social context of Appalachia. So I'm, I actually find myself speaking about Appalachia once Good. again. Because you're a son of northern Appalachia. Right, exactly. Right? My, my roots, of course, come from North Carolina and Virginia, and then they moved on into Kentucky and then into southern Illinois, a little part of kind of an undiscovered part of the heartland in the woods. That's really important stuff. Now, I'm curious, when you wrote this book, Resistance, did you begin writing this before Trump was elected? You must have, right? No. No, okay. No, no. In fact, uh, I began this book uh, last year. Uh, wow. uh, almost um, when my son uh, realized that Trump had pulled out of the, the Paris Climate Accords. And I had been thinking... That's how you start the book. Right, exactly. Right, and right. it's very much, uh, you know, I had been thinking about, okay, how do we begin to have a response to this phenomenon of what's going on? And once again, I actually was thinking about maybe writing another book about Appalachia. But my son came to me. He's 12 years old, and here we are now living in Iowa. And he, he came to me in, in a very serious way and looked at me and said, Dad, you know, I heard President Trump pulled out of the, the, the Climate Paris Accords. I said, yes. And he said, is there any hope? Mm. And his real question was, is there any hope for our future? And, and I realized, you, know, you can't be glib. You have your kid looking at you. They're right. actually waiting for an answer. And I could certainly give them some kind of lecture about climate action and climate change and regenerative cities like I've often done. But I said, no, man, we've got to go all the way back to our beginnings, our roots, and really talk about this continuum, this history of resistance, because we're finding ourselves in a position no less than we were a couple hundred years ago. So this is, to me, key. Because I've talked to a lot of people who would say, we're done, we're effed, mm. we're, it's over. You know, that, that uh, Trump has won and we're just in a horrible shape. And you start the book talking about somebody who uh, was almost a mentor of yours who went to jail with William Sloan Coffin, <clears throat> a great civil rights and anti-war activist that he right. was from Yale. And the quote you have of his name, you start the book, is hope resists hopelessness adapts. Right. So tell me where you think we are in that relationship right now. You know, I think we often feel like, boy, it's such dark times. It's never been darker than now. You know, we, we can hardly uh, get up in the morning and we have to have a cup of coffee before we look at our Twitter accounts as, you know, right. what on earth has he said today and what is going wrong? And it's true, we have dark times. You know, yeah. we learned today that only four children have been reunited with their parents who have been uh, separated due to immigration, uh, flawed immigration policy. Thousands of kids, you know, languishing, who knows where, in, in what kind of jailing situation, jail situations. You know, we know it's dark right now that, you know, 67 major environmental regulations have already been reversed. And, and we know right now with climate change, yesterday, from Canada all the way down to South America, from Oman to Australia, we hit record heat. Um, uh, records. And so we know it is dark times. But I often ask myself, you know, have we been through dark times before? If we, we speak to our, of our old ones, you know, what they went through World War II, if we speak about our own lifetime, you know, when people, when, when we were young, who could not use the same water fountain, who were segregated, uh, both in our schools and in our workplace, you know, we know that lynching was just shrugged at within our lifetime. We know that women never had a right not only to have uh, not own property, but not even to vote 100 years ago. That indigenous people have been displaced for 500 years. That in fact, the resistance has been going on ever since the foot 
first footprint from abroad came and, and, uh, into the Virginia soil. That we have always gone through these dark times. And so what I wanted to say was, how did we respond? How did we resist? And that begins with indigenous people, it begins with Africans and then eventually African Americans, it begins with our immigrant population, and ultimately it was seeded and manifested in our American Revolution. So the way you wrote this book is you took really important moments in our history and significant figures and kind of wound them through today's story as well, kind of mixing that with what's happening with Trump in today's world is how you kind of put this piece together, the book together. Exactly, okay. because everything we're going through today, we've already gone through in the past. And that was also something very important to me to show us that, hey, you know, history is not a blueprint for how we deal with today, but it informs us and it enlightens us and it brings the truth out of the shadows to realize, okay, this is how we dealt with it in the past, and once again, we're going to have to deal with it once again. So, and let's start, I mean, this is interesting to me because there are two figures in here, let's say, that you talk about a lot throughout the book. Mm. Um, and that's the second president of the United States, John Adams, mm -hmm. uh, and Tom Paine. All right. Um, and we really do, don't know in many ways, who these gentlemen really were and what they really stood for and the complexity of that moment, because it says a lot about the moment we're in right now. When you look at the Adams quotes, we'll talk about that in a little while, we could be looking at Trump quotes, right. that, which is really significant, I think. But let's talk a bit about that. I mean, so from the beginning, this question of the revolution that happened in America, the resistance that people like Adams and others actually had to the revolution when it first took place in the United States. Mm. His own racism that came out when he was talking about the Boston Massacre and, and how that, that came out and how the resistance also changed him. So talk a bit about Payne and Adams and why that is so important for us to understand at this moment. Right. You know, John Adams and this young cat named Alexander Hamilton, who's about 200 delay years late to get on to Broadway, <laughs> they said, hey, the, the country is really broken down to the few and the many, and obviously the few should run it on behalf of the obviously. many. Obviously. And then here comes Thomas Paine, this wonderful undocumented immigrant, undocumented immigrant who comes across. Tom Paine, undocumented immigrant. I like that. Go. That's, yeah. a, that's, that's good. Yeah. Who's, who's a complete failure. He's the dregs of society, twice in debt, he twice uh, broken marriages. You know, he can't even make it as a tax collector in England. You know, and here's someone who gets across on a boat, he gets carried off in a stretcher because he picks up a disease while he's, he's making the great voyage, and he can't find a job. You know, he's the dregs of society, but he's this man who's come here for this very reason of independence. He wants to be part of the resistance in the United States he's heard so much about, that Ben Franklin told him about in London. And Tom Paine was a commoner. And he realized in Philadelphia, it was these young cats that were actually moving the resistance along and not this kind of timid colonial elite. You know, Benjamin Franklin reprimanded what happened at the Boston Tea Party, and he wrote a letter saying, you should really pay back for all that tea you tossed in there. You know, and, the, and there was this movement going on of young people and merchants and workers and the dock workers and African Americans, what, what Adams called the mongrels, who were really leading the resistance at the point, confronting the British troops, you know, really physically confronting them. And as you note, you know, here John Adams, who was an attorney in Boston, actually represented the British government after the massacre of 1770 when dock workers took on the British troops. Thomas Paine realized we had to say something else, that this temerity had to be confronted, that this, we had to give a backbone to the American independence movement. You know, even after 1775, the shooting at Lexington and Concord, you know, shot heard around the world, and we often celebrate this as our, the beginning of our American Revolution, the Colonial Congress was t terrified. You know, they wrote this letter to the king saying, you know, if kind of maybe, if it doesn't bother you, we kind of would like to do our own thing, you know, but if that bothers you, <laughs> we are willing to reconcile. John Hancock. You know, John Hancock had a lot of declarations, and this was called the Olive Branch. And people like Thomas Paine were outraged by that, saying, you know, well, you know this brutish man, this brutish leader, this sottish, stupid leader is leading and wrecking mankind. Let's take him on. And so he wrote Common Sense published 100,000 copies. It was spread like fire throughout the colonies. People read it and realized, hey, now is the time for us to push toward our independence movement. So a couple of things with that. Um, there's so many aspects. We could talk about this one aspect for the next hour and a half, but we don't have time to do that. <laughs> you have to have the long program. You have a long program. A series program. Yeah, series. We could do a series. Yeah, there you go. Not a bad idea. <laughs> Got to bring you back from Iowa. There you go. Um, but, but if you take the particular thing we were just talking about, so Thomas Paine was an agitator and pushed really hard, became the king of, his, of, the, of the 18th century version of Twitter, as you write about in the book, mm -hmm. right? So John Adams becomes president. 
The resistance pushed him towards a new position. But at the same time, so let's explore that. One of the themes of the book has to do with how resistance movements, even though they might not know it at the moment, mm -hmm. actually push remarkable, powerful change and push powerful human beings in power to change, which happened to Adams to mm -hmm. an extent. Exactly. Right? It, you know, it's a great point, Mark, and I really appreciate you pointing that out because often we feel like, okay, resistance is protest. Right. And is there, what's the payoff? What's the direct result from our protest? Not realizing that there's this ripple effect and more importantly, a transformative effect. And that's what Thomas Paine often tried to talk about in his later writings is the revolution transformed us. But more importantly, we, the people, were able to reclaim the public comments. And so we may not have been part of that discussion, part of those decision-making periods, but we have forced the decision-makers to listen to us. And, it, and we pushed the envelope through the resistance movement to actually change history. And so, yes, you had someone like Adams who now suddenly was celebrating the Boston Tea Party. You know, and saying, wow, what a wonderful idea. These people really have an idea. And so when Common Sense comes out, Adams, you know, once again embraces it, even though he's terrified. He says, this might be too democratical, was his word. <laughs> democratical, he, that's that a great word. That was his great <clears throat> adjective. And, and if once again, he realized the movement was going without him. And to me, this has incredible relevance to today that the centrist in the Democratic Party or throughout the country, you know, it's either you're going to lead or get out of the way, but there is this new movement, a vibrant new movement of people in the modern day resistance movement. And by resistance, once again, it's those who are in the streets, those who are in the courts, those who are registering voters, those who are in the city hall, those who are in the, in the school districts, those who are in our communities. The resistance is not a, a singular uh, phenomenon. It's throughout the, the board. And I think this movement of resistance is really ultimately that's going to push leaders to, to make better decisions or more importantly, create new leaders. So I want to come back to the resistance and, and the historical moments that kind mm -hmm. of really parallel where we are today. But let's take a couple of them before I get into the, the, the third one I've been thinking about after reading your book. The struggles we have today around both immigration and freedom of the press and the press being attacked. Again, we have this mythology about America. And I've always thought that, you know, until the 1960s, George Washington chopping down the cherry tree, we had this mythology about who we are that was very white and mm -hmm. not very real. Um, so, but, this, but the idea of attacking the press is as old as George Washington. Mm -hmm. It's as old as John Adams. It's as old as the founding of the Republic. What Trump is doing now has its historical antecedents. Exactly. And so once again, Paine said, to resist is, is a patriotic duty. It's a fundamental duty to resist duplicitous authority that threatens our democracy, that we have to resist authoritarian spasms, that it's not that we're attacking Trump, not that we're attacking the administration or a conservative Congress. Mm -hmm. We have to reclaim the idea that we are defending our democracy and it is they who are attacking us from the outside, that fundamentally we are in charge of this democracy, we the people. And I think that's how Payne reframed it, that we can't just, you know, uh, allow other people to decide our fate for us. So let's get back to the press. You know, here's John Adams. He becomes president after Washington. And he, he, John Adams wants to be called his highness, his greatness, you know. And once again, he's obsessed. He wants to almost create a house of the lords for the aristocracy. And, uh, and he began to be criticized by the journalists who couldn't believe it. And, and he began to put his own relatives into the government. And then suddenly a journalist realizes, my God, he's colluding with a former enemy who's put money into our elections. Boy, doesn't that sound <laughs> awfully familiar? I love that. I, right. this is a great, it's an important piece of history because it yes. says a lot about us now. Right? And the journalist found out that thousands of dollars of Great Britain were poured into our elections that helped Adams. You know, think about it, in 1790s. And they began to criticize him. Adams, he couldn't handle that at all. And so he, with the Congress, they passed through this bill. And of course, Alexander Hamilton, who had a super thin skin, if you saw the Broadway show, you know, they actually passed the Sedition Act that said to write, to print, to say anything critical of the Congress, the government, or our president, his highness, we could put you in prison. It's a crime. And the journalists the next day posted on their newspapers here in Philadelphia, you know, the Aurora, it, it was published by Benjamin Franklin's grandson, Benjamin Franklin Bache, and Anne Greenleaf in, in New York and papers across the country. They put the Constitution on one side and the sedition on the other, and they said, okay, folks, it's either petition or resistance. Which side are you on? And there was this cranky congressman from Vermont. You know, it's always some cranky congressman from Vermont giving us a hard time. Once again. <laughs> His name was Matthew Lyons. He had this great newspaper called The Scourge of Aristocracy. He criticized. He said, we have a president who's obsessed with self-adulation. Boy, that sounds familiar. And they put Matthew Lyons into prison. 
for this, for attacking Adams. First person to go to prison under the Sedition Act. He still ran for Congress and he won from his jail cell. And once again, it vindicated that the resistance is beyond just the prison walls. Many of our great journalists were hounded. At the same time, they didn't just report the resistance, the journalists led the resistance. They worked with uh, Virginia and Kentucky to come up with a, a covenant. And to make a long story short, we get to the election of 1800, two years later. And it's the journalist who, according to Thomas Jefferson, arrested the rapid march to monarchy. And Jefferson became president and we threw it out. And so once again, this incredible encroachment by the government, this overreach we're seeing with Trump, you know, once again, Trump calling us the enemy of the people, but more importantly, you know, th threatening with libel anybody who criticizes him, has these earlier antecedents. And once again, we have to ask today, what is going to be the role of the journalist to confront Trump and, and, and can't hang on to this tradition of resistance? This, these were important points. As well. mm -hmm. It was like the book grabbed, grabbed me a great deal. Um, as well as your writing about immigration. Again, when people look at the battles of immigration, sometimes we take it back to the Chinese exclusionary laws and laws were passed um, to keep the, the Chinese out and then people not wanting Italians and Jews to come in. But this goes deeper. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, the roots of resistance to this and the roots of our battles around immigration go to the very founding of the country. Exactly. Right? You know, I, uh, I kicked off my book tour in Arizona for a reason. Because I said Arizona was Trump before Trump even came along, you know. And, I, and I've written a lot about the immigration battles there. And people who remind us, you know, they didn't cross the border. The border crossed them. And what they remind us, too, is in 2016, when Trump was elected, they took down Sheriff Joe Arpaio in Maricopa County. And in fact, there's this new movement that's really leading the resistance in Arizona that talks about the role of immigration rights. Our Declaration of Independence, the second most important uh, demand was the right to migrate, that the king would not let us migrate. And so migration was a fundamental credo in our movement for independence that we often forget. You know, Thomas Paine gets to Pennsylvania and he completely debunks this English concept. He said, less than a third of the people in Philadelphia are English speakers. You know, what is this thing? We are a nation of immigrants. Thomas Paine said, this is the sanctuary, the great role of asylum, that, that we should be a sanctuary colony, ultimately a sanctuary country. And George Washington agreed with that. In 1801, when Thomas Jefferson became president, in his first address to Congress, he said, we have to correct the mistakes of our immigration policy. Because John Adams, once again, had the Alien Act allowed him to deport anyone he found dangerous. This, this, to me, this is a little bit of a digression. Hmm. But when I think of Thomas Jefferson, and you write about Jefferson, obviously, in this book a lot, and you write about his contradictions. When he gave that speech, you talk about the contradiction uh, calling Native people savages, mm -hmm. and that, you know, that, that um, uh, and his relationship with Native people, also being a slave owner, mm -hmm. exactly. um, as was Washington. And you write about owning a judge in your book and the woman who escaped uh, from slavery from, from, uh, from Washington and, and lived to talk about it later. So uh, there's these huge contradictions that are taking place in the very beginning, even with pain so much or, so a bit around race. Exactly. I mean, you know, I mean, so that's, and that to me, as you, as you were thinking about this, I'm curious about the role that you think race has played in all of this mm -hmm. in terms of our resistance and what we learned how to create a resistance in many ways from the resistance of native people and African people in our country, but also that it's what has helped destroy the resistance. Exactly. Uh, and it's a, it's a huge question you're asking. And I think uh, I see the resistance. Because resist you wrote the book. If you hadn't written the book, I wouldn't ask you the question. <laughs> You know, and, and I see uh -huh. resistance as a truth and reconciliation commission. That what we're doing is repeopling a story that has erased people from it. Uh, I've, you know, dedicated my career to looking at the role of historicide, how we've removed people from history, including my, my own people in southern Illinois, strip mined and, and removed from history, Appalachians, African Americans, indigenous people and women. And so my role as a, a writer of the resistance, as a cultural historian, and the various works I do, is how do we use our history to re-people and re-historicize, not historicide, but historicize, write a new history that is more honest and more compelling account of who we are, the quintessential we the people. And I think the element of ethnicity has, has been at the crux of, of this contradiction, but ultimately this challenge. You know, once again, Thomas Paine didn't say, we must live up to the promises of the Declaration of Independence. They weren't promises to him, they were challenges. Right. You know, there were no promises at all. You know, the idea was, how are we going to make a more perfect union here?
And you know, after the revolution, he said, we're going to put aside our prejudices, and then we're going to work for a better country. And I think that was the day one after we, we became a country in 1782 was really the first day of the resistance. Because now we're a country, and now we began to take these seeds of resistance and make them realities in, our, in those challenges we're going to go after. And of course, ethnicity is really, I think, the question uh, at the root of what we're talking about today. I mean, I, I write this book knowing that my teenage son, it's one in 10 chance compared to African Americans in terms of him being incarcerated or brutalized by the police today. You know, we know the realities of how we've treated indigenous peoples. You know, I've worked so much work in the borderlands realizing, you know, the, the brutality of the police and other situations of, of people of color and immigrants, you know, to show me right. your papers laws. And so part of what I want to talk about with the resistance is how through history we've dealt with this. And I can give the uh, example, of course, of Fred Korematsu, the Japanese American who refused to go to the camps, as part of really the fundamental story of what we really wanted to talk about in the American Revolution, that that person has to be included. And this includes so many different characters we've talked about that we can continue to talk about who I feel like really represent the quintessential story as opposed to just George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and these so-called founding fathers. It's important to kind of take back the history to bring us the heroes, sheroes, as people like to say, heroines who, who kind of defined who we were that we'd never think about. You, you introduced me to some people in this book I've never heard of before. Before right. we do other things, I just want to talk about at least one of them, uh, which is William Apis. Apis? Apis, yeah. So I never heard of William Apis, but I love history. I read history day in and day out. <laughs> but William Apis is new to me. Amazing and story. So talk about it, because this is talking about native resistance from its roots. Right. After, after being commingled with, with the Europeans after colonization. I mean, this is a fascinating piece of our history. Right. And I appreciate you asking. And people like Ona Judge, once again. Ona the, Judge. One of the enslaved people for George Washington who right. escaped and who really, to me, defines the American Revolution, a woman who defied the president. Uh, and Maria Stewart in that same period, you know, this black feminist Another in one. Boston who really talked about white supremacy. You know, we build. She's so ahead of her time. Again, so you introduce us to people right. like Maria Stewart, right. who is somebody who's been lost to most of us in history. Right. So William Apis, a Pequot, who had a horrific childhood, who went off to the War of 1812 and then became literate and began to write his memoirs. He wrote a book called The Son of the Forest, which was, which was kind of fanciful. And then he became a, a Methodist preacher, and he began going to church to church and became, you know, a, an incredible orator. And then realizing suddenly I'm preaching to white people. You know, and, and where are the indigenous people? And, and the people would turn to him and say, well, the Indians are gone. And he would say, well, you're looking at one. You know, and so he began now to realize and reclaim our indigenous history. He did this incredible play based on King Philip's War, which was a 17th century battle between a native leader in New England who took on the British Empire. You know, and he said, this person is as important as George Washington if we want to talk about the American resistance. So in 1833, Apis finds himself on Cape Cod amongst the Mashpee community, which is still there today. And he says, hey, you know, why don't we invoke the Declaration of Independence? Because they wanted to control their resources. The forests on Cape Cod were being cut down. And so they went and they peeled on July 4th, 1833. And, and lo and behold, the Massachusetts legislature, these great liberals up there, said, of course, you can have your independence. And it moved forward. But nonetheless, white people came in and began cutting the trees down. And Apis confronted them. They put him in jail for, for 30 days. And he had this incredible statement where he said, you know, there's nothing you can do to my, because I have my conscience. You can imprison me all you want, but I'm right, and ultimately my conscience will win out, that you can't penalize or jail my conscience. And there was this young student at Harvard, because this was a huge story, a young student nearby at Harvard who read these, and that was Henry David Thoreau. You know, all those people with three names are very important. And Henry David <laughs> Thoreau, of course, thinking, wow. You know, 15 years later, of course, he writes, the groundbreaking civil disobedience, refusing to pay his taxes for the Mexican-American War. And, and Henry David Thoreau was amazing. He protected fugitives uh, of John Brown. He was a radical, an incredible person. And of course, his civil disobedience went on to influence not only Martin Luther King and Gandhi, but movements around the country. But we never talked about the fact that it was William Apis who influenced who Henry David Thoreau. Thoreau. Yeah, right. it was a Native American who really gave us this fundamental American credo of civil disobedience. And that's something we're seeing today in Massachusetts is a hotbed of civil disobedience against climate. And I'm thinking, thank you, William Apis. We really, it's really important what you've done here, I think, in many ways. I mean, making us realize what resistance means, how deep our roots of resistance are in America, that they're not a waste of time, that we don't always see things 
pardon me, that occur the moment we're resisting, but mm -hmm. the effect that resistance has mm -hmm. on this country and on changing things and on the power that erupts from the people is what you've given us along with these incredible historical figures that many of us never heard of before. You know, I really appreciate that. And I think that really is uh, one of the great aspects of history itself. You know, we forget that, you know, the, we, we lay the foundations for a lot of these movements. And it may be one or two generations later that we actually see the change. And of course, we know that from the Civil Rights Movement. You know, a masterpiece book for me uh, that I read often uh, and look at is Speak Now Against the Day by John Edgerton, who said there was the generation before the generation of the Civil Rights Movement that there were these crazy people in the Deep South taking on the white ruling class who risked their lives that we'll never know about in the 1920s, in the 1930s, in the 1940s, who laid the groundwork for what happened in the 1950s and 1960s. And I feel like that often is our work as writers, as historians, but as storytellers, is to collect these stories of people who have laid these seeds of resistance and then ultimately seen them blossom. So let's take it down to where we are now. Uh, and I was going to read quotes. We don't have time for a lot of quotes, but you can get the book and check out the quotes yourself because it's well worth reading. Um, it really is. And you're a good writer, by the way. Thank you. I mean that. I would, I would just interview you if I didn't think that, but I, I'm telling you because I think you are a good writer. Um, uh, and you know how to tell a story, which is really important in a book most people mm. don't get. Um, but let's take it to where we are now. And you talk about the regenerative cities, and you talk about young people in the, in the movement today and where people are, and the things that people like Ella Baker and others have said, you talk about towards the end of your book about how, how um, Ella Baker was the kind of a, the godmother of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, mm. um, said it is up to the young people. Thomas Paine said similar things. So talk a bit about where you think the resistance is now. Mm. Um, and by the way, the book is also chock full of great quotes from Trump, which really they gives you a sense of his tweets and what he's really thinking and saying and what he's attempting to do to us. But talk a bit about where you think this takes us at this moment. All right. You know, I think that's one thing about Trump, just to just stick on that for a second. You know, these tweets tend to be a distraction. Right. Uh, but if we really put them in context and actually line them up and look at it, you can really see the inner workings of the, the chaos at play right now and really the direction he wants to go in, the, the very dangerous the tendencies of, of, uh, of, of authoritarianism and a crackdown and, and denial, not only of, of our liberties, but democracy itself. So I, I really wanted to put those in to really document, you know, and, uh, and, and juxtapose that with how we're resisting. The young people, as Thomas Paine said, you know, uh, we have to, t to take them by the hand and join them. Ella Baker talked about it was young people who have the courage that we don't have. And I think we saw that with the Parkland students in Florida, yeah. who immediately afterwards you know, said, it's not a matter about talking and praying anymore. It's a matter about voting and getting people and getting these guys out of, out of office so we can actually pass real gun laws. Who were inspired by other young people called Black Lives Matter. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and really talk about the bigger question of how, why do we have this militaristic presence in our community? And why do we have communities that are dealing with these issues? I, I think what I really wanted to show was in the last chapter, if we, and I tried to bring it down, break it down thematically, you know, I look at uh, freedom of speech, I first look at We of the People and all the different movements, I look at freedom of speech and, and freedom of the press, I look at immigration rights and civil rights, and I look at uh, other aspects in terms of anti-war, uh, um, and, um, and then I go on and really look at the environment and climate, and I call this title Cities of Resistance, because I feel like we, you know, we often want to blame it on Trump and it's all this national policy and well ultimately there's nothing I can do because it's a federal policy and, and my thing is the real resistance has to happen locally. It happens, has to happen in our, in our communities, in our, our cities, in our towns, and on our campuses and, and even in our own homes and that begins with you know, saying okay where does this electricity come from that's powering this program right now? Most likely from a coal fire plant or a natural gas plant and what is the external cost to that to our communities that in Appalachia we know you know we lose three coal miners every day from black lung disease that thousands of people are unable to drink their water that we have cancer corridors from heavy metals going in from the, 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 the disastrous fallout of coal mining that we have to begin the process of saying okay if we truly are going to resist we have to bring it down to our day-to-day -day operations of how we live. You know, and that is our energy production, our food production, our transportation systems, our urban planning, and how we design in places that both segregate us from each other and how we can begin to heal and bring our communities back together. That ultimately resistance is an act of renewal. Thomas Paine said we have it in our power to reinvent the world. And I think we've reached that moment. We need to do that. 
My last chapter brings up one of the old Paul Revere's of ecology, Barry Commoner, who warned us in 1971, and that great, you know, bust, uh, excuse me, Brooklyn accent he had is, I don't know if, you know, capitalism <laughs> is gonna work. You know, it, it, can it be in parallel with environmental preservation? He asked this right. 50 years ago. And I think that kind of question has to be on the table now. You know, how do we begin to shift? And I think a lot of young democratic socialists are asking that question. You know, how do we rein in the excesses of what we're seeing with capitalism today? Because it essentially is not gonna uh, equate to a sustainable future in terms of the environment. And so I think step by step, we're seeing young people willing to consider new ideas and willing to put their bodies on the line, both in terms of civil disobedience, in terms of protest, in terms of like the young students in Phoenix who went to my reading, 109 degrees out there doing voter registration to turn around their cities, but in a way that they can create a regenerative city, a city that begins to produce what it needs as a functioning, sustainable city. And that, to me, is ultimately going to be one of the great resistance. It's inclusionary, it's based on justice, it's based on environmental justice, and it ultimately looks at how we are going to begin to reverse the process of this decline that we're in right now. Which is why this book, I think, is a uh, really important read for all of us. Uh, we're at a place now where the Supreme Court could be taking us backwards, but the resistance is pushing us forwards. And that resistance is nothing new. The resistance has been part of our country since the beginning. The book again, Resistance, Reclaiming an American Tradition by Jeff Biggers. Uh, and Jeff, thank you for joining us today. Great to have you here in the studio. Thanks for having me, Mark. It's a real honor. Really good to have you here. Great. And uh, he's off to Philadelphia now to uh, do another book conversation. And uh, it's good to have him here. And I'm Mark Steiner for The Real News Network. Talk to you all next week.